So I began by talking about how cryptography is something that arose from the imagination of cryptographers and we continued with the study or the introduction to secure channels as the most basic communication goal. So here um, I wanted to extend this introduction by saying a little bit more about this other aspect, about goals and ideas that go beyond secure channels and secure communication to things that you wouldn't naively think are part of cryptography, but they are because that's what cryptographers came up with and what they do. And they're quite fascinating and interesting um, as mathematical objects and puzzles, but also as new kinds of social games and ways of interacting. So this particular example is about Alice and Bob, who we've seen cooperating in um, establishing a secure channel and have been friends so far, but things went wrong and now they're getting a divorce. And uh, they have various complaints about each other. Alice thinks Bob is unsupportive, which is not too surprising for a sponge. And uh, Bob thinks Alice is unstable, which because she nibbles on mushrooms and keeps growing bigger or smaller. But for whatever reason, um, the things are not going well. Now, they have agreed about getting that divorce, but the um, issue is that they have a car, a nice uh, new Model S Tesla, and they want to know who gets custody. They are okay to determine that by a coin flip. So they say, let's just flip a coin and that'll determine whether um, Alice or Bob gets it, a heads for the first and a tails for the second. So that seems easily res resolved, except that they're no longer in physical proximity. Alice is in Wonderland, Bob lives underwater, and there's um, not clear how they're going to actually physically come together to flip a coin. But luckily the internet goes everywhere. So Alice has her internet connection in Wonderland and Bob has it down there. And so what they want is a way to flip a coin across the internet. So this at first seems rather easy and Bob suggests a solution. He says, I'm going to flip a coin at my little home here and I will send you over the internet by message or email the outcome. Okay. So Alice thinks about that a bit and says, I don't think so. Why does she do that? Because she has a security mindset and she knows that if she lets um, Bob uh, pick the coin, she may not win the Tesla because he's going to pick whatever outcome he wants. So we face perhaps a more difficult problem. We need... Um, uh, either trust, which is a little difficult in this case since they're getting divorced, um, and or we need a technical solution that will establish a coin in a fair way, a fair outcome, despite the fact that the parties don't trust each other and indeed might behave maliciously and try to subvert that coin each to their own advantage. So that's the problem we're going to look at, right? You want to get a fair coin, even though neither party uh, promises to play by the rules. First, we're going to do this via an abstraction whereby we ignore the internet and assume that the two parties are able to send objects to each other. And in particular, um, Alice will go to the hardware store, get herself a safe. So what is a safe? It's one of these typical combination-based devices where you can set a secret combination like 92093. We'll call that the key. And if that combination is entered, then you can turn the knob and the safe opens, and otherwise you can't. And as long as you don't have the combination, you can't see what's inside the safe or change it and so forth. So Alice buys this, and we will abstractly uh, use this notation to denote someone putting an object here, a bit actually, A, inside this safe. 
Think of writing that bid on a piece of paper, tucking that piece of paper into the safe, and then closing it and withholding the combination. And uh, that's what this represents. Okay. okay. On the other hand, once the key is provided, you can unlock the safe and remove that piece of paper and read its contents. That will be denoted in this way. The key appears, put it into the safe, and up, out pops the content. So you can make a safe and you can unlock it if you have the key. Okay, that's one part of our system. For the rest, we need another important tool for Alice and Bob and many other people, which is a bit of notation. So when we have a set, a finite set, big S, we will use this notation of an arrow with a dollar sign to indicate that an element is selected at random. The dollar sign is a, symbolizes coins and hence randomness. For example, if I write A is selected randomly from the set of 0, 1, which is the bit to bit 0 and 1, what I mean is that A assumes either 0 or 1 with equal probability. It's 0 or probability half and 1 with probability half. And now we're ready to show a protocol. This is what Alice and Bob do as their steps towards getting that fair coin which they need to decide who keeps the car. Alice begins by picking a bit at A at random. This is not going to be the coin. This is just part of the protocol. She puts that bit inside a safe. That means that she has the combination key for the safe and Bob does not. And we view Bob then as not being able to open the safe. And she sends that safe across to Bob, perhaps using Frederick's Pass or something like that. And now Bob has this safe. So Bob looks at the safe and it's of course completely useless to him. He can't open it, doesn't know what's inside. So why has Alice sent it at all? We'll see. Now Bob has a part in the protocol. He picks a random bit B. By the same process as Alice, he simply flips some coins and gets a random bit. He sends that to Alice and he sends it in the clear. So she receives this bit B. Okay. Now, Alice says, you know, I'm going to give you the key to the safe. So she sends across the key. Now, it seems a little weird. What's the point of sending a safe and then sending the key? Well, we'll see. So once Bob gets the key, he unlocks the safe, and then he finds the bit inside, and he obtains this A. The result is now that both parties are in possession of both bits A and B. Alice, because she picked and has A, and received B from Bob, Bob because he picked B and received A from Alice. We now look at the bit that is their exclusive OR, and we declare that as the coin flip, as the output of the protocol, which is going to be used to determine who keeps the car. Okay, so that's the protocol. And now somehow at some um, level, our claim is that this works meaning we're going to get a common coin out, and yet neither party individually is able to control it, meaning to bias it in the direction that will enable them to win the coin toss. So we have to see now um, why that's the case. And we have to look at two scenarios. One of them is that Alice is the cheater. So Remember that Alice wants the coin to be heads, which we'll identify with 1. She wants C equals 1, because that's when she gets the car. So throughout this protocol, imagine Alice now as trying to make that bit C equals 1. Since she's malicious, she doesn't have to do what the instructions tell her to do. The instructions say pick a random bit and put it in the safe. Maybe she won't pick the bit at random. Now, she does have to put a bit in the safe because Bob gets the safe and, and he sees a safe. But she could pick a bit any way she wants. However, we'll assume Bob does follow instructions. If Bob and Alice both fail to follow the instructions, we have no reason to want or, or um, hope for anything with regard to the outcome. If they both cheat, it's not 
particularly material who gets the car. We're interested in protecting the honest Bob from a bad Alice and vice versa. So our first claim in this scenario will be that Alice will fail. She will fail to bias the coin to the value one. The second scenario is that Alice is now is good. She's following the protocol, but Bob isn't. He's going to try to pick his bit B maliciously in such a way as to make that C come out to be zero, which is what he needs to win the car. Assuming Alice follows the protocol, our claim will be Bob will fail and the bit will be unbiased. All right. So in either case, we expect a bit that's um, going to be zero or one, each with probably a half and not controlled by either party. Okay, so let's take a closer look and see why this is happening. And we'll start actually with scenario B. So remember, this is the scenario in which Bob is the adversary. Now, the way we think about this is that Bob now has vanished. He's been replaced, taken over by an adversary. And this adversary is trying to subvert the protocol in order to make the outcome C equal to zero. So let's ask ourselves what this adversary has to do. Well, first of all, it receives a safe from Alice. It knows there's some bit in there and we'll call that bit A. Now it has to pick a bit B and it knows that the outcome is AX or B. If that is to be zero, it must be that A equals B. In other words, the adversary's task now is to make B equal to A. That is the only way it can guarantee that the output bit is a C. So can Bob adversary now actually make B equal A? And we see quite simply that it can't. Why is that? Because it doesn't know what A is. It's got a safe. And we are assuming, of course, the safe works. Bob cannot penetrate that safe. And if that's the case, Bob has no idea what A is and so cannot pick B equal to A. In fact, he really has no better strategy than picking B at random. So um, uh, he's stuck. Now, we have to remember that eventually Bob does learn A. Why is that? Because in the next step, it gets the key. And from the key, it recovers from the key and the safe, it recovers the value of A. And at that point, it'll say, aha, now I know A, so I can set B equal A. Will that work? No, because it's too late. The bit was already sent. The bit B was sent before the key was received. And that tells us why the ordering of these events was so important. Okay, so we have some sense modulo, of course, lots of little subtleties and details that Bob is not going to have an uh, easy time biasing the bit in his favor. So let's turn to Alice where things are a little trickier. So now the picture is reverted, reversed. Bob is a good guy following the protocol as shown. But Alice has been replaced by an adversary. So what is the first thing the adversary does? She knows she has to put some bit in a safe and send it over, right? She can't fail to put a bit in there because eventually Bob opens it and he's going to check a bit is in there. But nothing dictates that bit to have been chosen at random the way the protocol says. So she thinks, what do I need to do to win? Well, I want the outcome C to be one because that's when I, Alice, win the car. I know that Bob is going to send a bit B. So what I want then is I want to set A to be the complement of B, B, X or one. Why is that? Because then A plus B equals one. So Alice knows exactly what she needs to do. She needs to set A to the complement of B. Can she do that? No, she faces a big problem Namely, at the point she picks A, she does not know what B is. So she is going to put A in the safe and needs to do that before she receives B. And she doesn't know um, what B is at the time she picks A. Now, um, this is um, a first cut at what's going on here. So. The, there is another aspect of it where 
which is one of the subtleties. Since Alice can do whatever she wants, what if she plays around with the safe itself and concocts it somehow in such a way that she has an advantage? Um, How could she possibly do something like that? Well, let's say that rather than buying a safe from a store, she goes into a lab and she makes up this sneaky safe. And for some reason, this sneaky safe has the property that there are two different combinations that open it. That's fine. You could probably engineer a safe where there are two combinations that open it. But somehow, each combination opens to kind of a different compartment. And those different compartments contain different pieces of paper. One has a one written on it, one has a zero written on it. So now what Alice can do is she will ship over the sneaky safe. And she doesn't pick any bit to put inside. She she just sends over that particular safe. Now Bob um, innocently sends over his bit B. And Alice says, okay, I need this safe to be open to the complement of B. How will I make that happen? I know that there are two keys. One key opens the safe to a one, the other to a zero. And I simply pick the appropriate key. I now make the choice of key, in other words, dependent on the bit B that I received. And when I send Bob that key, it'll open, lo and behold, to exactly what I, Alice, want and the outcome of C will be a 1. So, if Alice could design this sneaky safe, she actually could violate security and win. But of course, what we are going to assume or imagine is that you you can't do this. Um, You can't make up such a safe. Or at least we have a way to ensure that whatever safe is sent was not produced in this way. When we talk about this at the physical level, it's a little nebulous, but eventually we will formalize it mathematically. And at that point, it will correspond to a property called binding. And in this case, an assumption that safes are binding. Binding means that once a safe is created, there can be at most one thing in it. In other words, you're committed to whatever you put into the safe. You cannot open it to show two different things. So now we can summarize a little bit. Um, We have a way to do this secure, fair coin tossing with a certain physical assumption that we have an object called a safe, which has two properties that we understand even if informally. The first is called hiding. That means that when a piece of paper is put in the safe and you get the safe, and you don't have the combination, you don't know what's inside it. You can't open it and peek or get any sense of what's actually inside it. This property is what we understand safes as having. That's not a surprising property. This property is important for Alice's security. Um, It's what's important for Bob to not be able to violate security. The second property called binding says that you cannot create a single safe which can be opened to two different things via two different keys. In other words, you can't create a safe for which you have two different combinations, such that if you type or enter one combination and open it, you see a one, and if you put in the other combination, you see a zero. So this is a weird property in the sense that we don't usually think of safes as being like that. But in fact, they, 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 they are. And so we are recognizing a property that we're using. And investigations like this show us that when we think about security, we're going to encounter claims and um, have to think about all kinds of properties like hiding and binding and so forth. And we have to be able to formulate these things and um, formulate exactly what we're thinking or assuming about security and what the security claims are. Now, of course, doing things this way is severely impractical. It's quite difficult to actually send a physical safe from Wonderland uh, underseas uh, to Bob, especially if the internet is all you have. 
So what cryptographers are really interested in is an actual electronic protocol which is done over the internet where you actually just exchange bits and that compromises the protocol. It's implemented in software at both ends. We will do that. To do that, we'll create a mathematical and algorithmic way to implement these commit these safes. And we call that a commitment scheme. And at some point in the class, we'll formalize that. And part of that, we'll formalize what hiding and binding mean for it. And then we'll look at different ways to build these schemes. And when we do that, we'll have an embodiment or instantiation of this um, coin flipping protocol. Okay, so this was an illustration of how cryptography goes beyond basic secure communication to consider all kinds of other goals that relate to people's um, social questions or just provide fun little um, interactions, but always with some sort of concern underlying them about privacy or or authenticity or something like that. Um, you could go a little further, for example, you could think about how to implement a secure gambling um, system using these kinds of techniques and there are many other um, similar things to be able to do.